Well, hello everybody and welcome to uh, this, uh, our BIPS uh, webinar series. Uh, my name is Lloyd Llewellyn Jones. I'm professor of ancient history at Cardiff University. Uh, and I'm really delighted to be hosting uh, this particular webinar, uh, which we've titled Open Sesame, Ancient Persia and the Greek Imagination. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome uh, to this seminar, um, Dr. James Frazier, who is a curator uh, in the Near East Department in the British Museum. And uh, more importantly, even for, for this particular event, he is the, the chief curator and really the kind of imagination and the, the mindset behind the British Museum uh, blockbuster exhibition, Luxury and Power, uh, Persia to Greece, which is uh, attracting huge crowds in London at the moment. And I'm glad to say really great uh, reviews uh, as well, both amongst the press and amongst the, the public who are visiting. So uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to showcase ancient Iran um, within the British Museum, drawing not only on the great collection of the British Museum itself, but also on uh, many uh, international lenders, including um, uh, treasures from, from Thrace that are rarely uh, modern day Bulgaria which are rarely left, let out of the country. Um, I've been working with Jamie myself uh, on aspects of the exhibition. Um, and uh, together, to, we, we've decided to do this as a kind of joint enterprise uh, to talk a little bit about the, the rationale of the exhibition and kind of some of our, our favorite things in it um, through this filter of open sesame, Orientalism and the Greek imagination as it were. Jamie, I'll hand over to you. Lovely. Thank you very much, Lloyd. Lloyd is uh, doing himself a disservice there because I think if there was ever a co-curator on an exhibition, I think Lloyd has taken that title. Um, this is as very much an expression of his imagination as it is mine or my colleagues such as Sinjin Simpson here at the British Museum. Um, and I'm very, very grateful for the input that Lloyd has had in steering the course of this exhibition. Notwithstanding, uh, two costumes that we've recreated, Persian costumes, that Lloyd really recreated, in part with some funding from BIPS, which you can see in the exhibition, and I'm sure Lloyd will talk about very soon. Uh, this exhibition does something, I think, at least I hope, a little different to what sort of mainstream traditional exhibitions do at the British Museum and do very well, I think. And that is to take one particular um, region or culture or even personality uh, and explore them in depth. So, you know, at the moment we've got an exhibition on China, we've had one on Peru, uh, Thomas Beckett, that sort of thing. This exhibition is slightly different because it's taking a concept and this is the concept of a very slippery concept of luxury what constitutes luxury and its relationship to political powers. And it stretches it across the worlds of Southeastern Europe, particularly Greece and Thrace and Macedon, and across the Middle East and Central Asia, the Persian world of the Achaemenid Empire. And it's doing that in the latter half of the first millennium BC. And built into that exploration, I guess, is an obvious political a, uh, sorry, historical asymmetry. Because of course, and I'm speaking to a very educated audience here, not telling you anything you don't know, but we look upon the Persian world predominantly through Greek eyes, the Greek historians who have written about the Greek Persian wars, the great clash between these two civilizations. Uh, and within that, we look upon how luxury operates as a mechanism, not from the Persian perspective, but from the Greek perspectives, seeking to explain Greek victories over their, the largest empire that the world had seen. And as you know, as Herodotus describes the capture of the royal command tents, he's building with a true narrator's flair to a kind of denouement, a kind of moment of astonishment, of looking at luxuries in all their splendor. If the Persians campaign in such luxurious style, no wonder they lost. They'd become corrupted and weakened and effeminized by the corrosive and cancerous uh, echoes, resonances of luxuries. And when you go into the exhibition, this is the first case that you'll see. These heads are actually facing each other. It's sort of a curatorial dramatic indulgence, if you like. But the one made in stone looks quite Persian. It's got a very 
Persian style beard, snail curl um, ringlets in the hair. It doesn't take too much imagination to see the Persian uh, reliefs from Persepolis of Xerxes or Dar Darius or whatever in this kind of form. The, the opposing statue made in bronze looks very Greek. It's an Apollo sort of figure done in an early severe classical style, much more serene expression, clean shaven, of course, the knot of Heracles knotted across the forehead. And yet this is the thing about these two statues. They weren't found hundreds or thousands of kilometers apart on the east and the western fringes of these two different competing cultures. They were found 40 kilometers apart on the island of Cyprus. It would have been possible they were made within a couple of decades of, of each other, standing in sanctuaries at the same time. It would have been possible if you had a particularly souped up donkey, I think, to have visited both statues from which these heads come in the course of the same day. The island of Cyprus on which they were found, of course, although it's part of the Persian Achaemenid Empire, um, is inhabited by different Persian speaking, Greek speakers, um, Phoenician speaking, local Cypriot speaking groups, all reaching for different styles for different purposes. And when you look at these two statues, although they seem so black and white in terms of being poles apart, actually the boundaries between them start to blur. The stone Persian looking one is wearing a Greek wreath. And from the clothes that the statue would probably have been wearing, for which we have other examples in the British Museum, he was almost certainly dressed in Greek style clothes. And the, the metal bronze statue, although it looks like an Apollo figure, was actually found next to the sanctuary at Tamassos, which was a sanctuary to Reshef, an Eastern god. So a Greek style god in Eastern guise. And so I guess the raison d'etre in driving this exhibition is not so much, we've got this historical conflict between the Persian world and the Greek world, in which attitudes to luxuries are very different and very polarized. But actually, when we look at the objects that they leave behind, there's a lot of crossover and a lot of, bound, a lot of blurring of these different boundaries. And so suddenly you get a lot more nuance about what it means to be part of that broader and highly connected Greek Persian world. The exhibition is kind of set up in three sections. We talk briefly in the first section about uh, what luxury is doing in Achaemenid Iran. We're exploring how luxury is being used as a highly effective and highly sophisticated tool of imperial statecraft. Uh, we then move into classical period Athens, where we see Eastern style luxury reflected through a glass darkly, if you like, into this early democratic society that's rejecting Eastern style luxury as being decadent and ostentatious, and yet hitting it around a very Athenian style anvil to make Eastern style luxury acceptable within this very different democratic society. And then we bring both worlds together under the world of Alexander, particularly the Eastern world of Alexander and the successor kingdoms, where of course, in this new international Hellenistic style, we have fusions of Eastern um, Persian, local and Greek, classical Greek styles, all fusing into one new Hellenistic aesthetic language, if you like. Um, and I'll explore just those three those three sections really through one example, and that is drinking, um, and particularly right on drinking vessels. What you're looking at here are three such vessels that we've got on display in the exhibition. The one with the griffin head is in the permanent collections of the British Museum. The one in the middle is a silver right on with the head of a gazelle that's on loan from the Louvre. And the slightly chunkier looking one is um, I'm really pleased to have this one on display because it's never been to the UK before. It's one from the Arabuni Museum from Yerevan in Armenia. Riton's look like drinking horns. Of course, they're not. Riton is a word that comes from Greek, rios, which means to flow. And if you can look really carefully at these images, you might see on the Griffin one, the British Museum one on the far left, the Griffin has a pendant hanging down across its chest. And there's a recess into which a semi-precious stone or some glass would have been set. 
And you can see that reasonably easily. If you then go down the torso in between the outstretched fore parts of, the, um, of that griffin, you might see a stubby, short little spout. This is the spout through which the wine would flow. So imagining me as the Persian king, and that will take some imagination. This is an era of reclining dining. So the, the king is reclining on a, on a couch. He has the right on held up in one hand, his thumb stopped over the spout and balanced dexterously on the fingertips of his other hand is a gold or silver bowl. A servant would fill enough wine in the, the right on to fill the bowl, although the, that right on can take up to one and a half bottles worth of red wine. Well, don't ask me how I know. Uh, then he would unstop the spout to release the stream of wine into the drinking bowl and he would drink. This is an act of theater and an act of performance and an act of showmanship as much as anything else. And I think you have to imagine the king in, a, in his large tent, perhaps traveling between the various capitals. There's been a large banquet of the various nobility, the aristocracies, the satraps, the governors gathered together the king in the rarefied area where only the select few can visit and drink with him. And that gold and silver right on the fine wine, the fine food is bestowing prestige and authority upon the king. But it also works the other way around because, of course, the king, by using these sorts of vessels in this sort of way, is bestowing prestige and authority upon the objects as well. And that's particularly important because, of course, the king is gifting these sorts of objects out as he moves around the empire. And that system of largesse, of gift giving, is not only bringing the ruling elite who are representing the king's authority into the fold, buying hearts and minds, if you like, it's doing more than that because after the king has, has long left, the ruling elite in his stead are using these same objects to perpetuate their own authority again to the to those who they're ruling over thereby kind of emulating and perpetuating perpetuating the king's authority at all levels throughout the the fringes of the empire and i think you can see that particularly well in that slightly squat erebuni right on the one from armenia because it's probably made from a local Armenian craftsman at this time. And although it looks quite Persian in the way it's it, in the way it's reaching, in the way it functions, it's quite different in the sort of the shape and the style. It's chunkier, it's actually got three spouts at the top, and it shows um local sort of echoes of Uraturian kind of uh techniques as much as it does Achaemenid. What I find fascinating, and I'm going out on a bit of a limb here, but what I find fascinating is that. The spout there is a Persian rider. It's a Persian rider with a beard, a Persian hat, the Persian riding trousers, the Persian short sword hanging over his tunic, over the saddle, um, the saddle cloth. And I find that quite extraordinary because in Persian writings, you don't find Persians making Persians on Persian writings. To me, this is perhaps like during the British Raj, a Maharaja learning to play cricket so that he can be more English. Than the English. Is this a local aristocrat or a local ruler on the fringes of the Persian world up in the Caucasus, being more Persian than the Persians, reaching for something to show authority that owes its genesis to sort of the Persian center? Oh, and here's our uh, two of our wonderful collection managers when we were measuring up these objects uh, before display, kind of showing that relationship between the right on and the bowl. Uh, what you're looking at now is a slab from a relief called the Nereid Monument. The Nereid Monument was constructed as a mausoleum for one of the local Anatolian dynasts, a guy called Urbanas, around about 393 80 BC. So we're talking sort of southwest Anatolia at Xanthos at this time. The facade of his tomb we've got recreated at the British Museum. We're right on the cusp here between sort of the Ionian Greek world and, of course, the Persian world, and this local Anatolian king is playing on both tropes. His mausoleum looks like a Greek temple, although it's surmounted on a podium as you would a Persian tomb. But what I find fascinating is that when it comes to his insignias of power, there is nothing Greek at all about what he's doing. He's got his Persian beard, he's got his right on up in one hand and the bowl in the other. 
the insignias of power are those insignias of Persian luxury, just as you would the king. I love the little dog underneath the couch on this. I, it just reminds me of my dog back home. And although I think you can see the success of this imperial court style moving horizontally through the various courts of the Persian world, I think its success you also see because it's moving vertically down different strata of society. The objects you've got uh, on the left here, or at least my left, are the elite gold and silver objects as you would find in the court of, of, of a ruling dynast. The ones on the right are in clay and in bronze, and these were found in the tombs of Persian soldiers stationed at a place called Deve Huyuk near Karkamish on the border between Syria and Turkey. Um, and in fact, they were dug by Lawrence of Arabia, T.E. Lawrence, uh, during the Karkamish season. Uh, and at one point, he, he writes back to his father, it was archaeological daring do of the highest order because he chases tomb robbers from these tombs and has to clear out some of the material overnight before the robbers could, could return. I think the, the physical similarities between these are, are obvious. What the Persian soldier, the drinking kit with which he's buried, the wine strainer, the right on, reference very clearly the elite sort of stuff being used by the Persian aristocracy. But whereas one is the Gucci handbag, if you like, that you buy from a high class Bond Street boutique, the other is the Gucci handbag that you would buy outside Tottenham Court Road Station. But it's the same thing and it's showing, I think, the success of that system. When we get to Greece, and by Greece in here, I'm particularly talking about Athens because of course, Greek is a series of city states, all independent with different forms of government. Things are a little different. Greece, of course, resists and then ultimately repels the Persian invasions of southeastern Europe, um, which, although perhaps a minor skirmish on the western fringes of the Persian Empire, is a seminal moment for the Greek national or the Athenian national psyche. Um, as an Australian, I, I kind of compare it in my mind to Gallipoli, modern Australia, the psyche of modern Australia would not be the same without the, the battles of Gallipoli in World War I. And it's kind of the same thing, all pervasive. But of course, drinking in ancient Athens was a very different affair. Um, we're talking a symposium, a symposium where adult male citizens would gather together in a particular symposium hall or the private room of an individual. Dining couches would be aligned along the inside walls of the room so that no one was preeminent over the other. This is a democracy where social inequality is quite deliberately trying to be suppressed, even if it is present. And a symposium is about equal drinking. Um, an MC would be elected by those present for the event, not necessarily the owner of the hall or the owner of the house in which they met. Now, indulge me, I've got a, a, a description of a symposium, which is bears no relevance to this at all, the Persian imagination, but is just a lot of fun. Three bowls of wine only do I mix for the sensible. One is dedicated to health, the second to love and pleasure, the third to sleep. When this is drunk up, wise guests go home. The fourth bowl is ours no longer, but belongs to outrage. The fifth to arguments, the sixth to drunken revel, the seventh to black eyes, the eighth is the bailiffs, the ninth belongs to bitter anger, and the tenth to madness that makes people throw things. It's a wonderful description, and I rival anyone to find a better description for the British Museum staff Christmas party. What I love about the drinking cups that you associate with this symposium are these animal headed ones that I've got on display uh, here. These are exotica, they're novelty items, they never become mainstream, but those Persian write-ons are there resonating in the Athenian society. Some of them are captured as booty off the battlefield, they're kept inside repositories such as in the Parthenon, and we know this because they're inscribed on kind of inventory lists, ancient kind of Excel spreadsheets, if you like. And of course, Herodotus tells us about how the booty was captured and divided amongst the Greek hoplites, Greek soldiers who would never have access to this sort of luxury before. So I think these sort of Persian objects of ultimate unimaginable luxury are, are buzzing and humming changing the Greek perception and imagination about 
what luxury could mean in this somewhat resource poor limestone peninsula. But the concept of a ride on that sort of prestigious, ostentatious way of drinking is anathema to the equality of a symposium. And I think Greek potters respond to it in some really innovative, clever, subversive ways. Although potters do make write-ons initially, they whack on a handle, they whack on a flat base, and it just, it just doesn't work. That early experiment kind of flickers and dies fairly early on. But what you get are these sorts of vessels, these extraordinary animal-headed drinking cups. They don't they're not pouring vessels, they're drinking cup vessels, but the animal head owing its genesis, if you like, to the animal heads of the Persian write on. But here, they're no, not to bestow prestige, they're the butt of jokes in which everyone in attendance is part of that in joke crowd. Imagine drinking the wine from that donkey headed cup in the center, and you literally become an ass in front of all your mates. The more wine you drink out of the boar headed cup, the more animalistic you become, snarling, losing your humanity, becoming more, more um, outside yourself, that sort of Greek ecstasis. My favorite, though, is this falcon or eagle-headed drinking cup. You can see the, the pointed beak of, uh, of, the, of the, the tip, the sharply defined eye underneath that very high eyebrow ridge. Now, this is an object all about transformation. You can't put this down. Once that's full of wine, you're stuck with it until you finished it. But when you have, when you do, the only way to put it down is to turn it upside down onto its rim. And then the whole thing changes. It changes from being the head of a bird to the complete bird itself. The beak becomes the hooded head of a bird of prey, the eyebrow becoming the high sort of shoulder of the and ridge of the bird's wing. It's a playful, innovative, very Greek response to something that is ultimately Persian. And of course, you can see this sort of thing in the way that uh, the Greeks are responding to Persian parasols as well. Parasols being one of the macho, masculine, Chuck Norris symbols of Persian masculine royal authority. Again, also referenced on the Nereid monument by King Urbanus. Um, in um, Xanthos in Western Turkey. But in ancient Greece, well, if you are in ancient Athens, if you are a man to walk through the agora with a parasol or with a servant with you, behind you with a parasol, is a very destabilizing thing to do. You're referencing political authority, political leverage, which is anathema to that society. It's a very destabilizing, very dangerous thing to do that ultimately could lead to charges of Medization, Persianization, resulting in your ost uh, ost ostracism from the city. But in the world of the feminine, that's a different matter. And you see parasols, particularly in the latter half of the fifth century BC after the Persian peace, becoming quite chic objects of cultural cachet with Athenian women. And of course, here they've been neutered of any of their political danger, because in this early democracy, of course, power is held by male citizens, not female. So they've been stripped of any authority they had in this kind of act of subversion, taking something that is so particularly masculine and royal and subverting it into something particularly Athenian and feminine. The third section deals with the sort of compilation of styles, the hybridization of styles under uh, Alexander the Great and the success of Hellenistic kingdoms. And Lloyd mentioned at the very beginning um, a loan that we've got from ancient Thrace, modern Bulgaria. This is the famous Panagirishti treasure. And if you do anything in the exhibition, bolts to the end section just to look at this. It is quite extraordinary. And the main question we've been getting from members of the public is, is it real? How have you polished the gold? Um, and this can't actually be real gold. And of course, the answer is, is yes, it is real. And no, we haven't polished it. This is what gold treasure looks like. It's just luxury on steroids. And I think if you're going to be arrogant enough as a museum to put the word luxury in an exhibition title, you're kind of implicit that you're going to go big. And I think this has gone big. It was discovered in 1949 by three brothers, the Dakoff brothers, who were digging clay in an industrial clay pit. 
uh, for a local brick factory, the town of Panagarishti. They thought they discovered some musical instruments by some Romana uh, travelers. And in, when this photograph was published in a local newspaper, an archeologist, the local museum in the city called Plovdiv went, hang on a minute. This is perhaps one of the most significant archeological discoveries made since the Second World War in, in Europe. And I think that actually still holds, certainly one of the most spectacular archeological discoveries to have come out of Europe since the Second World War. What I'm so pleased about this, to have this on loan from the National History Museum in Sofia, is that it does everything I need it to do in the title of this exhibition. And this title exhibition, Luxury and Power, Persia to Greece, it's doing a lot of heavy lifting in that Persia to Greece thing. So the ex this treasure was made about 300 BC, give or take, so a couple of decades after the death of Alexander in 323. And what you're seeing, are, apart from that libation dish, eight objects that are all write-ons. They're all wine-pouring objects, even those ones that look like Greek, Greek drinking-headed cups, which, of course, is a very Persian way of drinking. And some of them, particularly the um, write-on amphora, particularly the goat-headed write-on, look very, very Persian. And even though ancient Thrace, ancient Bulgaria has not been part of the Persian world, or at least the Persian empire for 150 years, you can still see these resonances, hear this light motif resonating in the way that it's been made. But there's also some very obvious Greek references there as well. The three human-headed drinking cup write-ons are, are all feminine. One has got the griffin helmet of Athena. The other two have sort of stars on the veils, which are referencing um, Amazonian warriors. And the others have figural scenes um, punched in, in relief along their necks or their bodies, all showing scenes out of Greek mythology. Uh, you know, Paris judging the beauty contest between the three goddesses and all this sort of stuff. So it, it blends those two things very neatly together. But the luxury and power concepts is doing extremely well as well. And that's really centered on that centered um, on that sort of key piece, which is the spouted amphora, which is in the middle of the of the um, of the display. You, you can't quite see it in this um, photograph, but on the other side of that amphora, what you're seeing is uh, a series of naked Greek warriors with their swords drawn, all attacking the city gates of a city. And it's probably the attack of seven against Thebes. And if you know your Greek mythology, Thebes was ruled by King Oedipus. Um, and Oedipus had said to his two sons, he made them make a sacred oath that upon his death, they would rule the city on his behalf. Of course, he dies, they don't. Tragedy ensues. And this is a scene all about the violation of a sacred oath. Now, imagine a Thracian king holding one of those centaur-shaped handles with another party with whom he's entering into a sacred agreement, another Thracian king with whom he's marrying his daughter or they've reached a peace settlement or a financial transaction. So you have two parties holding each of the handles of this vessel. And if you can see the bulges on the bottom, both of those are the spouts. So out of the same vessel, you have the wine flowing in two streams into two drinking bowls, symbolically drinking from the same vessel. And of course, this is a period in which poisoning is a very real tool in the political toolkit of self-advancement. So eliminating that issue of poisoning as well. Uh, and so it sort of beautifully wraps up luxury, power, um, Persia and Greece, but ultimately, what I love about this is that scratched onto the libation vessel and scratched onto that drinking vessel are their weights, because, of course, these are operating as much as bullion as anything else. But their weights are given in two currencies. They're given in both the Persian direct currency and the Athenian drachma. And dare I say, it's like the US dollar and the Chinese yuan today. This is the, the twilight of the, the ascendancy of the Persian direct. And this is the dawn of the ascendancy of the Athenian drachma in the sort of the Balkan Peninsula. And whoever's made this is hedging their bets. And I love that about this. Sorry, Lloyd, I went a bit longer than 20 minutes, but over to you. That's quite all right, Jamie. What you said was superb. And I shall be quoting luxury on steroids for some time to come yet, I think. I've chosen uh, just one object that I want to look at, uh, one object in the exhibition, an object which I've 
I've long liked and long admired, actually, uh, because for me, it is a kind of open sesame uh, to a Greek um, feeling of Orientalism and how it filters um, the ancient Persians through a Greek understanding. So it's a lekythos, which is a little perfume flask, not very big at all. Uh, it was certainly made in Athens, and it dates to around about 410 to 400, maybe even a little later, 4, 4, um, 3, 80, 390 possibly. Um, it's a beautiful piece. It's it's very well painted um, and it's a very, very lively composition. Um, here it is in its uh, full dimensions, but we've, uh, for the catalogue for the exhibition, um, Clara Potter very uh, kindly did a, a line drawing so we can have a kind of spread of the uh, events that are going on there. And what I want to do basically is to break down um, what's going on in this vase. Um, because here we have, of course, the, the Athenian um, imagination working overtime uh, in picturing uh, the Persians. What we seem to have here to begin with, of course, is uh, a, a great king, a Persian great king, um, sitting on the back of a, of a camel and a kind of howder, uh, or a palanquin of, of some kind, um, looking very Persian in his strange um, striped uh, um, trousers and his long-sleeved garment, and surrounded by members of his court. And you can see there are musicians, there are fan bearers, there are torch bearers, and there are also individuals dancing uh, as well. So it's a scene certainly of some kind of festivity. It's important to say that at the date in which this vase was created, so let's say in the opening decades of the fourth century BCE, the Persian Wars are a hundred years gone. And the way in which the Persians had entered into the Greek imagination, of course, was initially around about 520, 500 BCE, where scenes of warfare or combat between Persians and Greeks were common. That's the way, of course, in which the Greeks were filtering their ideas through um, the, the traumas of, of conquest, invasion, or the threat of invasion, at least, that they were dealing with. But a hundred years later, after the Persian Wars have been fought, and while Persia is not out of the picture for the Greeks by no shot at all, it's still the most powerful empire in the world, the Persian threat is being neutralized somewhat with scenes like this, which are far more celebrations um, of um, the exoticism of ancient Persia. For over a century, the Greeks, and in particular the Athenians, had witnessed Persians. They knew what they looked like on the battlefield. They had captured um, Persian tents, Persian clothing. Um, they had feasted in Persian ways. They had uh, morphed their own um, traditions to echo Persian uh, tropes as well. And so there's a very different feeling in fourth century Attic art uh, about the relationship between Persia and Greece. Essentially what we're doing here is that we're looking in a world far, far away in almost a once upon a time quality. It really does have a, an open sesame uh, feel. It's very much in line with other kinds of artworks created by uh, Attic, that is Athenian painters at this time. Famously, there's a huge vase in Naples by uh, an, an individual we simply call the Darius painter, which shows uh, a scene at uh, the Persian court, the center and lower band of the line drawing that you can see there, which has a kind of theatrical flavor about it, almost as though the Persians are in fancy dress. And likewise, this uh, little lekythos, um, which is gilded and with raised um, figures, uh, which is by a man called the Xenophanes painter, and now in St. Petersburg, which was found in the Crimea, shows a kind of fantastical version of the Persian royal hunt. Persians who are named, incidentally, uh, Abokrames, Darius, Cyrus, and so forth, uh, are shown in this kind of mythological setting where they fight, uh, where they hunt for boars, but also they hunting uh, mythological animals, perhaps on the far um, section of the, of the vase, uh, you can see on the left of the screen, you can see there, there is a winged griffin, for instance. One of my favorites is this huge crater, uh, now in the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna, 
uh, which shows um, a kind of fantastical scene of a great king um, seated within his court. There he is on his throne within a kind of naos, a little sort of uh, almost like a little shrine. A woman stands before him, fanning him. And on either side of him, you can see there are dancing figures and also musicians, very much echoing the themes of the camel lekythos um, that we began with. And this is very much the, the kind of feeling that we're having in the fourth century um, artistic response in Greece to um, the world of ancient Persia. So what I want to do is to zoom in to one or two details of this vase to try to put it into its, its context. How do the Greeks get to this understanding of a Persian world, this rather fantastical Persian world? And let's start with the camel. Now, as far as depictions of camels go, um, it's not so very bad, I suppose, um, but one gets the feeling that the artist who created this red figure vase um, is painting a camel from a description rather than from seeing it in real life, I would imagine. That's not to say that the Greeks didn't know about camels. And in fact, the earliest camel representation I've ever found in the Greek world dates to about 550 BCE. So this is really at the time that, that Cyrus is starting his campaigns uh, in Lydia, for instance. Uh, and it's a Bactrian camel as well, a two-humped camel of all, of all things. And this um, uh, vase was found in Boeotia, which of course was under Persian occupation um, for, a, for a, a, a quite, a, uh, quite a while in the, in the fifth century, but it's a pretty good camel. I mean, that's, that's quite an accurate camel. Um, less accurate, less successful, uh, but rather charming is uh, this pelike by the Argos painter dated to the period of the Persian Wars themselves. Um, and this shows a camel driver um, with another Bactrian camel, uh, with a rather elongated uh, back and uh, a serpentine kind of neck. How did the Greek artists get these images in the first place? Well, of course, either they saw camels or they heard reports of camels, or they were able to access bona fide Persian uh, uh, images of camels created by <clears throat> Persian artists, possibly in Asia Minor, such as this bulai, this seal stone, um, because, of course, these kind of images, bulai, um, seals, especially when pressed into wet clay, um, could travel very, very widely indeed. So even um, an unsuccessful uh, artist like this had uh, an inkling of what a camel looked like, perhaps from uh, a genuine bona fide Persian version. And at Persepolis alone, there are four very, very fine representations of Bactrian camels. Um, who are gifted to the great king by various delegations, mostly from Iranian speaking peoples, including Bactrians themselves. And you'll see from the detail that I've given you there, um, the, the, the level of um, um, representation is of, of very high indeed. And this has to figure as a really, really fine animal portrait. The haughtiness of that camel um, is something which is, is very memorable. Camels, of course, were core um, to uh, ancient Persian life alongside the horse, which played an equally important role in uh, Achaemenid society. From the Elamite cuneiform text, which we know as the uh, Persepolis fortification text, for instance, we have uh, many uh, accounts of uh, um, a herd of camels that belonged to King Darius the Great. Um, there's consistently uh, 33 of them, uh, and these tend to be, um, they tend to follow the great king whenever he moves locales. So when he goes from Persepolis to Susa or from Susa to Babylon, um, his, uh, his own herd of camels uh, go along with him. So um, the king is a herdsman uh, as much as anything. And of course, within uh, royalty today, this is the king of Jordan, of course, um, the expression of power and prestige of luxury indeed um, is still articulated through the use of the camel. Camels, of course, in traditional camel societies are used uh, not only um, as pack animals, but more importantly, in a way, as uh, animals for sport, camel racing, um, camel wrestling, and of course, uh, amongst the army. And we know for certain that the Persians had a camel corps uh, in the Achaemenid army known as the Ushabara, um, Ushra 
uh, being the ancient Persian word for the camel. And from a series of seals that we have from the Achaemenid period, we see the great king both in a camel pulled chariot, as well as uh, hunting lions in the wild uh, from cam camel back. And Strabo at the end of the first century BC also recalls that uh, place, a village called Gaugamela, where of course a famous battle was fought with Alexander, um, Darius III lost his empire, but the name of the village Gaugamela means camel's house. And it was uh, given its name by Darius the Great um, because he housed his favorite camel there, uh, or so we are told, living in particular luxury, I wouldn't be surprised. So that's the camel. And then of course we have the camel rider, the great king of Persia himself. You can see he has a little whip uh, in his hand. His other arm is, is kind of out, um, stretched out. It's almost as though he's kind of um, trying to keep his balance as the, the ship of the desert um, sways back and forth as he's sitting strangely on the, this, this howdah kind of side saddle, if you like. It's a sort of thing that the Greek artists really like playing with. Um, in the exhibition, we have this beautiful little um, vase of a Persian soldier um, sitting uh, on a donkey. And what this uh, does, of course, is uh, allow for foreshortening for the artist. And whenever we see foreshortening, so here the, the, the legs, the feet and the toes uh, of the, the soldier and uh, here of the king, um, this always um, kind of rings some sort of a, a warning bell in the viewer's head, because of course, most Greek vase painting shows the human body side on. So when we see something like this, automatically we think, oh, there's something strange going here. And I think what's going on here is that the artist is trying to show this is kind of weird, this is exotic, this is not us, it is very much part of the other. The king himself um, ha is depicted in a very kind of conventionally um, Greek way of, of good looking uh, men with a very, very straight nose. It contradicts what uh, Xenophon tells us about Cyrus the Great. He says in the Cyropodeia, um, because Cyrus the Great had a hooked nose, um, men in Persia all favored hooked noses and thought them the, themselves to be the most beautiful, those who had the most exaggerated hook. But here we have basically uh, almost an like, Athenian dressed up in Persian fancy dress, if you like. And this very distinctive form of clothing had been around in the Greek imagination of the Persians ever since the, um, the first time that the Persians came into um, the Greek world. The Greeks were absolutely fascinated by this uh, riding habit that the Persians wore, consisting of a long sleeve tunic, very often with a long sleeve coat worn over the shoulders, but most notable, were these trousers. Perfect garments, of course, for horseback riding and camel riding uh, in, the, in the ancient Near East, uh, but totally, totally um, uh, out of the ordinary for the Greeks. In fact, Herodotus um, states in his histories that it was the Athenians who were the first Greeks to endure the sight of Persian trousers, to actually endure them. So trousers as something of a trauma. But it's this kind of clothing which remains over the centuries uh, in the Greek imagination uh, for the Persians themselves. By the time the camel Lekathos is painted, the Persians are, uh, the Greeks are really obsessed with this idea of the king and the luxury of his court. And several scenes which are extant take the viewer into the harem of the great king. Um, you see he uh, on the, the, the vase at the center there from um, Cyprus, uh, we have a great king seated on a throne, holding his scepter and drinking from a retron with a woman in front. And then the larger uh, Pelike from the Louvre shows the king with two of his women. Now, these women, of course, are not depicted in Persian dress at all. And that's because basically the Greeks have no concept of what Persian royal women wore. And so they simply depict them as um, Athenian upper class women. But what is interesting here is this fourth century um, notion that we can penetrate behind the walls of the royal harem to look at the private life of the king. And in a way, this is what's being picked up on the camel lekathos as well, with the presence here of the king's entertainers. We've already recognized them on the vase from Vienna on the left of the screen. Uh, you can see dancing uh, 
boys and dancing girls doing exactly this kind of dance, which according to the Greek sources was called the Persica, which was a Persian um, uh, war dance or a ritual uh, dance of, of, of masculine triumph, uh, essentially. Um, whether this really is it, of course, is open to debate, but certainly the, per the sources, the Greek sources talk about this style of dance. And then we have um, a series of musicians dressed in Persian clothing, but actually playing very Greek looking instruments, timpanis, uh, kithara uh, and double aulos and so forth. And on the other side of the vase, uh, we see that continuing again, more of these musicians, uh, more of the dancers, male and female interspersed. Of particular interest, I think, are the, um, the um, bare-faced individuals, um, shaved features, uh, of these men. They're certainly in male costume. You can see that they, they contrast quite clearly to the female on the left side of the vase there. Um, they are in male costume, but they are um, beardless. Uh, and that's in striking contrast to the other men on the vase, the king himself and the people dancing the war dance. Uh, and these are probably uh, Greek representations of Persian eunuchs. Now, um, the Greek historiogra historians um, spoke a lot about eunuchs. They were obsessed with this idea of the male castrati um, from the East. They, were, they, they found it abhorrent, but absolutely fascinating at the same time. But it is quite clear that by the fourth century, very wealthy Athenians were using castrated men as slaves within their households, usually as prestigious things like doorkeepers and stewards. And in fact, this very, very rare fragmentary red figure vase here from Athens um, shows a, a castrated uh, male slave. Um, so his eunuchs are, are pretty much part of that Greek conception of um, uh, as living beings as luxury objects uh, being utilized within uh, Greece. Um, we can look in the exhibition, for instance, these are both there um, for the use of peacocks is a similar motif. Peacocks coming from Persia and being used by um, wealthy Athenians. When you put this whole vase together, um, it's clearly a scene of, of some sort of um, celebratory uh, procession. Benjamin Isaac, uh, in a paper he um, uh, submitted to a volume on racism in uh, antiquity, described this scene as a hotbed of orgiastic dissipation. Now, maybe my uh, idea of uh, uh, orgiastic is different to his, but I simply do not see it here. What I do see is a kind of festal feeling, certainly. And Alan Shapiro thought that way, maybe what we have going on here is um, a theme playing on the idea of foreign gods um, being encountered in Athens for the first time. And we do know that in the fourth century BC, um, Near Eastern gods were certainly being part, uh, were part of the religious landscape of Athens at this period. But I don't think that's really what is going on here either. I think what's being kind of played with here is a very well-known Persian happening, and that is the way in which the king of Persia migrated around his empire um, from location to location, essentially enjoying the, the warmth of a perpetual springtime, as Xenophon puts it. It's part of the peripatetic lifestyle of the court. Um, here we have a chart basically telling us uh, where different classical authors place um, the royal court uh, at different times of the year. But essentially what we get from the classical sources is an annual migration between Persepolis, Babylonia and Ekbatana, modern Hamadan in the north, constantly every year in this endless migration. And the, the, the Greeks were very well aware of this and they were quite obsessed with it. It's part of a, a, a rich cult, court culture that the, the Greeks really fixated on. And incidentally, it's exactly the kind of um, court travel, the peripatetic lifestyle of royal courts that we see in Persian societies of later dates, in particular, of course, uh, amongst the Mughals uh, of India, Northern India. So uh, to finish with here, what I think is going on in, in this vase then, it, it's not a, a kind of uh, a degradation, a playing down, or, or even a kind of um, uh, riff or um, uh, a kind of, um, comedy 
on uh, the Persians. I think it is a kind of a somewhat orientalist idea of the king, the luxury and power of, of the, his majesty himself, but it's not done in any disparaging way at all. Um, but it has got a dose of Orientalism, without a doubt. But I think actually it's a very benign Orientalism. Um, it, it is not a weakening thing. The, the great king here is, is master of his court, master of his lands, uh, and is celebrated as such for his wealth and his ability to control uh, a huge cortege of individuals like this. So rather than being a negative form of Orientalism, I think this is a very positive spin on the great king and his court. Fantastic. Well, everybody, I, I want to thank you on behalf of the British Institute of Persian Studies uh, for joining us this evening for this webinar. Uh, and in particular, I want to thank uh, Dr. James Fraser uh, for uh, his wonderful paper and answering such a uh, question so well. It just remains to say thank you very much again for attending this, and we hope to see you at the next BIPS webinar. Thank you very much. <laughs>